Are you looking to engage your children in a more meaningful Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, davening prayers? That was a question that I posed to parents last week, and I encouraged a great deal of feedback. How is it going in terms of engaging your children? How did it go in past years? Are you hearing anything from the kids now? I actually got a significant percentage of parents who contacted me said that their children did express um, being disinclined to participate fully in, in davening for one reason or another. And obviously that's not a statistic fact because people would be more likely to respond if they had an issue with the kids. Not, nonetheless, these parents and many others that I spoke to did really feel that it is an issue with some children and perhaps it's becoming more of an issue now. So I'd like to share with you some of the feedback that I got from those parents, from educators that I spoke to, from leaders of youth groups. I spend the week collecting this information and I'd like to share it with you. So to begin with, I think we should just discuss general barriers to having children daven the way our current Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur davening is set up. And there's a language barrier, which obviously doesn't exist in Israel because the children speak Hebrew. But in, you know, overseas, in America, in the diaspora, where the children don't have fluency in Hebrew to a great degree, so that's a barrier, of course. Um, the text is unfamiliar, even from what they're davening all year. And there's just simply the length of davening, the time that the adults are in shul on Rosh Hashanah and certainly on Yom Kippur is either double or more than that of what they normally uh, daven on a regular Shabbos. So obviously that's going to be a challenge and that's been a challenge basically all along. There are some new challenges and I did get feedback from parents and educators about that also. Um, one of them is dramatically diminishing attention spans. As you can tell, you know, the, the, the kids who are in middle school and high school now were probably the first generation of kids that grew up in one way or another with access to technology, even if it's not internet related, it's, it's certainly very vibrant and, and interactive, um, even if they're playing games. So attention spans clearly are dropping. The research uh, clearly indicates that that's a fact. Um, it was very interesting. A number of parents, I totally didn't see this one. Um, a number of parents said that the kids, they felt that their children perhaps had gotten um, an interruption of their shul life, meaning their, their participation in community davening during COVID for a pretty extended period of time. And that that's lagging a bit you know, in, in the other side of it, as we came out of COVID, that's lagging a bit. And if you think perhaps that that might not be the case, and it's possible it isn't, none of this is research-based. This is just all anecdotal, but I think it's important that we think about what um, anecdotally is, is emerging. Think of all the people who didn't go back to work yet or are more inclined two, three days a week to work out of the house to not get dressed up for the office. So many people have switched their lives that way because they just found out during COVID that they were able to do things differently. I increased the number of interactive, um, you know, internet-based, either social media or, or Zoom parenting classes are, are certainly much more that way. So you, you say, well, if I can stay home and do this, why am I? So the kids, this is what parents said. It was really fascinating to me. Obviously, again, I don't have young children at home. So of course I didn't see that, but I think it's something parents should really think about. Um, I did mention at the beginning that I had a theory and that I wanted to share it. Many parents asked me what that thought was. So I'll share it with you again, just my take on it. One of the things that the middle school, high school, or all kids have nowadays is tremendous access to content, 
whatever that content is, it could be, you know, Coco Melon videos for three-year-olds or other types of <clears throat> downloadable files on, on, on any of the platforms. They basically got used to having whatever they want right away. And they make these programming choices. It's really fascinating. You watch the kids. If, if an ad comes on for 15 seconds, they start getting cranky. And if a video that they may have liked, you know, but not like that much gets into the feed, they're much more likely to change. So I'm just thinking that if they're thinking of content and making choices, they're much more liberated to be able to select content that they like. And perhaps, perhaps looking at, let's say, a, a five, six hour davening on Rosh Hashanah, they just might find that content, that packaging, so to speak, just too much for them. And, and it might not be a sign of disrespect when they say that. They might just be honest and say, you know, I, I just, that just sounds like a lot. I don't know that I could um, daven and shul all day. Now, my practical advice to parents, especially the advice that I got from youth leaders and people who lead um, youth minyanim, youth prayer services and shuls, some of the larger shuls um, have staff that actually runs programming for, um, you know, pre-teens, pre teens, teens uh, pull out minyanim, and, and other places have, like I spoke to Rabbi Josh Brody, who runs um, a like a beginner service for people who aren't that fluent with with the regular davening. And he said it's a tremendous success. Um, I, my wife and I volunteered for Madregos. It's an organization that supports uh, young men and women in recovery. And their entire program, the davening, is set up that way, that there's a regular davening in shul that proceeds at the pace that most shuls participate, you know, the pace that that davening uh, evolves and, and, and goes, the time frame. But there are pullouts throughout uh, different components of the davening where people can go out and learn more about davening, um, reflect uh, on the meaning of the prayers or other things like that. And that's what these youth minyanim are all about. So here's the advice that I that I got and that some of it is, is my own thoughts on this to parents in a very pragmatic way. Is first of all, don't overreact. If if you're if you tell if the children say something like this, that you know that the davening is just too long and and I just don't find it you know, meaningful, if they say something like this, I really encourage you not to overreact and and say things that are harsh or or even uh, even like rigid that would be very, very judgmental of that. Listen to the kids. Ask them, tell me a little bit more about it. You might find different responses, that some of which you might not even have thought of. So just let the kids talk, inquire, what's your reasoning? What is it that you're finding difficult? And they may say, the, the checklist that we said, I don't, you know, I don't understand what we're saying. I don't understand the davening. I, I, you know, some people, some, I've heard this from children that they say, it's like really scary. Everybody's tense and shul. And, and, and again, another thing is that they're kids, they're young kids. They, they think they're gonna live forever. I mentioned earlier in the week that one of the challenges of dealing with adolescents is that they're not vulnerable. So they they tend to um, drive irresponsibly, or do other engage in other irresponsible behaviors because nothing's going to happen to me. So that's also we pray when we're vulnerable. So that's another piece of this whole thing. Um, if you aren't sure if their response is reasonable, I would encourage you to ask an educator in your community who really gets it, or a parent who has kids older than you do. Let's say your oldest child is 10 years old or 13 years old, and they're expressing this. Go to someone who has 18-year-olds already and find out, like, did they hear any of that from their children? Um, again, responding in a measured way and even better yet, if the children can identify, let's say that they find the, the Hebrew to be a problem. So then you can design a solution for that. You can 
do some of the tefillos, the prayers beforehand. You know, there's a lot of different things that you could do once you know what's really going on. Um, assess your children individually. Um, some of the kids have longer attention spans, some of the kids have shorter attention spans. That's just the way it is. Look at the adults in shul. You could have, you know, siblings in the same family who are, who are grown men and two of them have great attention spans, one of them doesn't. That's the way it is. So judge them, assess them differently and try to figure out perhaps an individual package for, for each of them. Prepare them. Um, if your child is a reader, for example, and, and loves to read, find a, a, a book, uh, uh, go to a Judaica store and find some content, uh, a book or two that talks about Yom Tovim and Davening. If the kids are a little younger, maybe a book that has more pictures about it in a way that to give them something. So if they're, you know, therefore when there's a, a, um, a well-known tefillah or a, a prayer that everybody would want their children to be next to them during that part of it, so they can do that. And then they can sit down, you know, and read afterwards. Get supervision for the kids. Don't let, please don't leave, let the kids run around shul unattended. It's not safe. It's not for a whole bunch of reasons, especially child safety. Um, so prepare in that way also. Um, if your shul doesn't have a youth group, um, I just discussed it with Rabbi Josh the other night, Rabbi Josh Brody. Um, and if you have Instagram, you can look on, uh, on my page. He did a, an incredible interview um, talking about his work and, and offering pragmatic solutions. Find, find an educator. You can hire somebody, hire a, a, a Rebbe, a teacher, for a Mora, um, to sit with, with the boys or the girls and, and talk to them through those, those type of pullouts that we spoke about early. It's not an incredible amount of money. And you might even be able to get some parents to volunteer for that. Um, you know, the, the, I went for the first time in 46 years, this, this year on, on Tisha B'Av, I went back to Camp Monk where I spent 13 summers as a child. And just to be there, I found it incredibly inspiring. You know what they do there? They, there are a total of about 30, 40 kinos, you know, uh, uh, lamentations, things that we say to, to remember the, the tragedies that happened on Tisha B'Av. And um, there are about 30, 40 of them. Most summer camps only do eight or 10 or 12 of them. And usually a different staff member or administration member talks, uh, spends 10, 15 minutes talking about the next one that's coming up, and then they say it together. It's incredibly inspiring. Here's another way of doing it. Ask, ask most adults, you know, think yourself, what was the most meaningful Tisha B'Av experience that most people will tell you, many people will tell you, it was my time in camp, because they have um, that type of, of attitude to it. And in fact, it says, this is in Chazal, our sages say, Toiv Ma'at bekavana. It's better to say less, meaning to read less text, bekavana with it, with with an understanding of what's going on. Me 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 harbe shalabi bekavana more than saying more than that without um, kavana, without you know paying attention or knowing what you're saying. So, you know, many shuls have their regular tefillos, and and that's that's wonderful. But if the kids need an adjustment. Um, I, I would encourage you to think in, in that way. Um, another thing you could do before Yantiv is you can do yourself talk to kids about the tefillos that they're saying. Have the kids write their own tefillos in English. It, it's such a beautiful exercise. I used to do it with my students. Um, I, I, you know, talk to them about what would you daven for, or what would you pray for, and, and ask them which tefillos they found most meaningful and let them tell you about it. Maybe they learned about it in school. Um, you know, talk to them about the notion of, of apologizing um, when, when we, we do things wrong that we know we shouldn't be doing and how a sincere apology that if a child, if a child, they tell them, if you do something that, you know, mommy and tati, daddy, we, 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 we're not happy about, or if you come to us and say, please don't punish me, 
it's 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 important it's a good step but if you come and say you know i know how much you do for me and i love you so much i i feel so badly that i did that that's like 12 steps higher than that so try to overall the feedback that i got and and listening to parents and educators that would be my overall advice be pragmatic about what the barriers are for for meaningful davening um, come up with a plan to to address one or two of those points and, and make sure that you don't, um, if the child is being honest with you and telling you the way they feel, that he or she feels that the davening isn't working for them, um, I would really encourage you not to behave in a way and, and respond right away and say, well, that's terrible that you don't respect Fila and it's Rosh Hashanah, everybody in the world is... I don't think that'll get you too far. I think you'll do much better by listening to exactly what it is that they would like adjusted and trying to make those adjustments for them. I hope you found this helpful. Please feel free to post comments and if needed, I'm glad to do a follow-up on this. Best wishes for a wonderful, meaningful Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I could the bench everyone.